Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's all great to see you here. I recognize some friends and faces from last night's uh, exceptionally informative um, event by speakers Jeffrey Clements and Bob Monks, who is with us here today, on the issues raised by the legal doctrine of corporate personhood and its consequences. So I welcome you back. And I would also like to welcome uh, those of you who are joining us for today's special session for the first time. I am Janine DeLay, president of A2 Ethics, one of the co-sponsors of this program, along with the Interfaith Partnership for Political Action, or IPPA. Uh, before we hear from our moderator and panelists for today's program, I want you to, to, to be alerted to other chances in, in this room to become informed about the issues we are covering in what I think of as a two-day Citizens United Palooza. Um, <laughs> and on the sides of the room, you can see presided over by that cutout of Theodore Roosevelt, who as president used his bully pulpit as he called it, to call out corporations for their political activity and warned us about the very real consequences we are now facing of the deluge of corporate money drowning our democratic political process. I'm so glad I said that. Um, <laughs> this exhibit is very much integral to what we're trying to do, which is to urge citizens to learn about this issue and as a result of what you learn to talk back to the Supreme Court and take action to get Citizens United reversed and to build on the initiatives for a 28th constitutional amendment to eliminate the legal doctrine of corporate personhood and the notion that a corporation can actually speak and have the same rights as human beings. So please check it out. And while you're at it, we have some handouts to offer information on the back table there under A2 Ethics and IPPA. These handouts include information about um, our activities, but also information that you can take away with you on groups uh, that you can get involved with uh, and, and, and uh, go forward and, and go out of this room and help, help us turn this around. Today, the panelists are Robert Monks, uh, whose work, Citizens Disunited, and other works such as Corpocracy, inspired this very program. Mr. Monks is uh, the go-to and foremost expert on shareholder rights and responsibility, corporate governance, investor stewardship, and corporate societal impact. He has also been a force in the business and legal worlds, founding three companies designed to improve corporate governance practices. The most important one for us today at this session is GM, uh, GMI Ratings, which conducts research and audits, uh, which assess sense, uh, sustainability and other standards of corporate behavior. And then Professor Emeritus Don Monroe, who is also serving as our moderator on the uh, far you're right. Don is a founding member of this pro program and a co-sponsor. He's a um, founding member of the Interfaith Partnership for Political Action. He held dual appointments in the Department of Philosophy and the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the U of M uh, for over 30 years and is the author of several important books uh, in Chinese philosophy, um, of all of them that I have read, and they're fabulous. Um, Robert O'Neill. Uh, is also a founding member of IPPA, and he was a clinical professor of plastic surgery at the U of M Medical Center, uh, where he, there is an endowed chair uh, in his name. He's the author of numerous papers in scientific journals. I have to admit that I wouldn't have understood them, so I have not read those, um, <laughs> and has lectured widely in this country and abroad. All three of our panelists come forward today as experts in their respective fields, but equally noteworthy for all of us as citizens, they are here because they care about an issue. They've done research on this issue according to a particular standard uh, that IPPA uses, which is what is uh, the corporate behavior's impact on human moral values and the planet. And then they present their research um, to elected officials and then encourage all of, of you to do the same. So today our program is, is pretty packed. The overarching question is this. Um, 
we're tying it to last night in this way. Why would it benefit us as individual citizens to give corporations expanded rights as Citizens United has when many of the behaviors of corporations impose social costs on people and places that the, the corporation does not pay for, but the people and the community do? The examples our panelists are looking at are most um, um, are ones that we know about and very close to home. So let's begin. Thank you, Janine. I'm kind of going to move back and forth between there and here. Um, to remind you, last night we focused on Citizens United its meaning and its consequences for the nation as a whole. Today our focus is on the consequences of money and power, especially Citizens United for Ann Arbor as a community and perhaps for some neighboring communities. Um, what I'm going to do today is to begin by identifying six different human moral values. These are uh, values that our bodies normally are predisposed to seek. They, co they contribute to cooperation, which enhances the survival and flourishing of individuals and groups who cooperate. And our knowledge of these six moral values has been enhanced in the past uh, 30 to 40 years by the findings of the cognitive sciences, biological sciences, and psychological sciences. Um, the first of these moral values that I'll mention is health and the well-being psychological well-being of the body and mind. The uh, impact on people's health and well-being of my first uh, example, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, is the following. According to a study of 798 people by the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics, I quote, foreclosure is associated with rates, high rates of major depression, hypertension, and heart disease. When we turn to J.P. Morgan Chase, we find if we only go back two years, we find that J.P. Morgan Chase is settling for over uh, $1.1 billion with the Department of Justice, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and so forth. That $1.1 billion is going uh, as being set aside for payments to borrowers who are in trouble. The second set of uh, moral human moral values is a set that includes love, compassion, sympathy, empathy, kindness. This is first observed in the relationship between infant and caregiver. It gradually evolves into relations in the greater family and then beyond the family and ultimately is the source of altruism. Once again, I refer to uh, a long study developed in California by the Alameda County Health Department. Foreclosures not only impact an individual's or household's health, but can affect community health as well through the disruption of social networks, through increasing in blight and crime and loss, and loss of revenue for the city. The displacement of families results in the disruption of the sense of community in a neighborhood and the social networks that existed. 
Well, those are networks that are bound together by the sense of uh, sympathy, empathy, that are uh, part of our biological status when we uh, are born. The next set is respect or dignity on the one hand and the avoidance of shame on the other. These are universal values and disvalues. They probably uh, derive in part for, for our, from our being, uh, for our be, being in social hierarchies and ex, experiencing being in social hierarchies. They're ex, ex, exhibited to some degree in other mammals, in chimpanzees and so forth. Um, well, in any case, um, let me explain what shame is. Shame involves an individual violating a rule, being aware of the violation, and knowing that other people know of the violation. It differs from guilt. It is not guilt because one can feel guilt as guilt before God, even if no other people know about it. But in the case of shame, it requires that there be social knowledge of the violations. Well, again, going back just a year or two, one can find J.P. Morgan Chase charged with consumer fraud, paying out $310 million in restitution and $80 million in fines over fraudulent credit card practices. In August, uh, excuse me, in July of uh, last year, 2013, J.P. Morgan Chase was accused by the Department of Justice and the Federal Re Energy Regulatory Commission of rigging the electric markets, the electricity markets, and manipulating power prices in California. Now one can ask if the employees of J.P. Morgan Chase experienced shame when faced with these investigations. Individual human people would. Humans would feel shame if faced with these charges and sometimes convictions of criminal fraud. Uh, but unlike, corp unlike human beings, corporations normally uh, have a person so unlike our persons that they don't feel shame. They settle. Corporate personhood, if there is such a thing, does not accept responsibility for transgressions. There is no accountability. It has agreed to settle paying fines that are regarded as simply a part of doing business. And the fines are not paid by the managers or officers of J.P. Morgan Chase who approve the dangerous policies that lead to the criminal charges. They're paid by the shareholders and by extension, in some cases, by taxpayers. <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, on only one occasion has J. P. Mo J. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, made anything close to an apology and that was in June 13th, uh, June 13th, 2012, when he told Congress that the bank had made a terrible, egregious mistake when it uh, lost $2 billion in risky event investments in London. Uh, at the moment, the fine for that egregious mistake is $13 billion which is a pittance if you look at the uh, 
holdings of J.P. Morgan Chase. The next uh, human moral value is fairness. Fairness, again, is one of those values that emerges biologically. Um, it is experienced in the form of equal sharing, uh, something that has been studied. Uh, there's a long study of it in the journal Nature uh, in 2008, emerging quite clearly by the age of seven and eight. Of course, uh, in practice, societies vary in what they will regard as equal sharing. Um, they may regard giving X quantities of gifts, as it happens with the Northwestern, some of the Northwestern American Indian groups. Uh, another group may figure that you should give less of the gifts. So there's variation. Uh, in our own society, the payment scale for uh, corporate officers uh, did not used to be anything that challenged the popular view of fairness. It's only within about the past 30 to 40 years that gradually uh, that has happened. And the sign that when that level of fairness uh, is breached, then executive pay becomes a political topic on which some shareholders demand to have a voice but of course, with our Supreme Court, that advice can only be an advisory role on conclusions already reached by those on the boards of directors. Well, as for J.P. Morgan Chase, its pay ratio for the CEO is 229 to 1. The CEO pay and benefits are... $18.7 million for the year ending in 2012. Trust and integrity. Trust is essential to non-coercive relations between uh, leaders and lead. It promotes cooperation and enables people to have some justified foresight regarding their matters of concern. Now I ask you, can there be a trust relationship in banks when the purchaser of a home, of a home loan, does not know who owns the mortgage that he or she is taking out? Formerly, the mortgage holder was a local bank in which the loan officer was likely to be known by the borrower. This is certainly true of our local, one of our major local banks, which is the Bank of Ann Arbor. But it is certainly not true of the mortgages issued by J.P. Morgan Chase. The final set of values is learning and foresight. Foresight is a product of our uh, age in which we needed to know which paths had good game to them, which paths led to predators. Uh, so foresight is about uh, probable risks and advantages to our choices. Um, so it's awareness of what the probable risks and advantages are of different choices. Um, now, one can ask the question of these major corporations, um, how much attention did they pay, did they pay uh, to the risks that they were asking uh, their customers? Uh, the people who took out their loans, the people who bought their stocks, how much risk did they reveal to their customers, to their stakeholders? Let me just give you one example. When the American International Group, AIG, Worldwide Insurance Company,
began to collapse in August of 08, no one among the executives knew the magnitude of the debt of AIG. They thought it might be around $20 billion. No one had taken the trouble to find out. But it took a team of outside bankers only 72 hours to discover that it the debt was at least $85 billion and counting, and the counting went way above $100 billion in debt. Now, you note that when we're talking about those large corporations, it's not a lack of brains of people. Pre- the, uh, the big banks and some of the other financial services organizations Uh, higher quants, that's what they call them because they deal in quantitative matters and they're often physicists or mathematicians. But what they put them to work doing is checking on uh, the short-term profit for the future. They never asked them to look into what are the consequences for the joy and suffering, the health and well-being of the stakeholders connected with the company. Now, to return to J.P. Morgan Chase, in March 14th, 2013, a Senate panel issued a critique of the J.P. Morgan Chase regarding the bank's $6.2 billion trading loss in 2012. The report found that the bank's executives ignored growing risks and hid the losses from federal investigators. They did so by inflating the value of their positions in order to hide their losses. Now, I'm going to turn at this moment just very briefly because I know uh, Bob Monks will get to this point uh, in his own uh, talks about corporate values and how they stand in contrast to the human moral values. Uh, When one talks about uh, corporate values, of course, at the very top is short-term profit and loss. And there's no way in which one can understand that without also understanding the term externals. The term externals refers to Uh, shifting the costs uh, that affect people outside the company and did not themselves choose a policy to shift the responsibility for dealing with the costs which are often in the pollution of water or air or in foreclosures of properties to shift those Uh, financial costs uh, outside the company. Um, One of the reasons for that, which Bob Monks will get into, is that in the general, generally accepted accounting principles, which is standard for uh, companies in this country, there is no place for social impact or environmental impact. So you can be in obedience, in compliance with the generally accounted, acceptable accounted accounting principles, and yet have no place therein for the dangerous social and environmental impact. There are times in which corporations do uh, voice an interest in some of the moral values I've mentioned. If you read their brochures, they will uh, focus on integrity and in sincerity. Um, In its annual report for Goldman Sachs, in its annual report, Goldman Sachs in 2007 stated, integrity and honesty are at the heart of our business. This was at the very time that it was selling near worthless securities to customers who did not know what they were getting. 
Now, I don't want to be a total cynic. There are times in which corporate executives have recognized that there is a value in social responsibility, but it's a value one might note because it helps the market. Um, Walmart started as, uh, prior to 2005, it started uh, losing stock value and having lots of charges for its anti-green policies um, laid out. Because of this bad image problem, it took stock of itself. Uh, its own stock had dropped 20%. It had a new chair, CEO, who said, whose name is H. Lee Scott, who said, as businesses, we have a responsibility to society. Let me be clear about this point. There is no conflict between delivering value to shareholders and helping solve bigger societal problems. After that, the changes that it made increased its shareholder value. There are other companies, uh, certainly, that uh, one can find in Mr. Monks's GMI ratings. Uh, that have very positive ratings for social impact and environmental impact. One of them is Coca-Cola. Uh, one of our local companies that does is Office Max. So there are good examples out there, uh, not simply the ones that I've mentioned. So now I'd like to uh, turn things over to Bob Monks. And by the way, I n neglected to say, and I'm sorry I didn't mention, that you, you're welcome to raise a question at any point. You're welcome to, re to re raise a question at any point. You don't have to wait till the end of the talks. And if you do have a question, just go up to that mic in the middle of the room there. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> I'm totally sorry. Yes, uh, Bob O'Neill is next. We will talk about uh, Gelman Sciences, which then became Paul Sciences. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> present some information of record on five corporations, three of which uh, have had a local presence in Ann Arbor and two others that are closer to the East Coast. We'll talk about their activities um, that could be pot potential detri potentially detrimental either to individuals or to the larger communities. And I think there are examples of the, um, the danger to health and well-being as well as suggesting lack of human values such as Don has just talked about, foresight, fairness, trust, and the lack of shame. I'll also, as, as we go along, introduce some questions that arise out of the examples um, of why corporations do not act as responsible human beings or citizens. The first example I'm going to talk about is Gelman Corporation, um, which uh, in 1966 be began using a substance called dioxane in their manufacture of medical filters. And from 1976 to 1985, the dioxane that was used and then had to be discharged was dumped into unlined lagoons and sprayed into the soil around the corporation and began seeping into the ground. And in 1985, that was 20, uh, 10 years after they started, it was discovered in 30 wells north of the Gelman property. This is, on this map you can see this is uh, I-94 uh, here, Miller Road, there's the Gilman property just off Wagner Road. Uh, so uh, they, they began to, the, the corporation began to supply bottled water to the, uh, uh, the involved uh, companies and uh, people and paid for the city to uh, put in water lines to the affected subdivisions. And then finally, in 1992, there was a settlement of a legal action between the state of Michigan and Gelman Sciences for $1 million in damages and $4 million for cleanup. 
1997, the company was then sold to Paul Life Sciences, uh, which bought Gelman and, and assumed their uh, liability. But uh, they have su subsequently left Ann Arbor, although the, <clears throat> the cleanup uh, still goes on. And um, even our director of environmental quality for Ann Arbor, Matt Nod, who is going to be here today and has provided me with some information, is actually today in Lansing talking to the State Department of Environmental Quality about trying to raise the, uh, the bar for the cleanup standards from one that's higher than most other states at 85 parts per billion to get it down to six parts per billion, hopefully sometime this year. So this map here is, shows this plume of <coughs> underground progression of dioxane. The, the, the green is the less concentrated uh, that's not dangerous, but this area here is the higher concentration, greater than 85 points per billion, and this is a restriction zone, and there are all sorts of wells along here which are used to constantly moder uh, moderate this as it goes along. So here we are uh, in 2014. It's something that happened way back in 1960. Um, so uh, one of the questions that's raised here is, uh, should a community expect a local corporation to feel or express shame when a potentially harmful event does occur? Um, the, um, the next example is Pfizer Corporation. I think most of you know that Pfizer had a large research and development facility here, uh, which everybody thought was going to stay and be a permanent member of the community. And they suddenly, uh, in an unanticipated closure and leaving, left Ann Arbor in 1997. It was a shock to employees. There were 2,100 jobs lost. And it was a blow to the city because it was a loss of a tax base of 2 million square feet of office and research space. It also had an adverse effect on uh, Washtenaw County's some programs that were in process and also for the U of M and uh, the life sciences community. Since leaving Ann Arbor, uh, Pfizer has pleaded guilty to uh, and paid $2.3 billion fine for promoting uh, drugs for inappropriate use. And then since the GMI ratings that Don just mentioned uh, have taken over rating Pfizer, they've, um, it, they've gotten low ratings for all the environmental, social, and governance issues, and also uh, the GMI ratings reported that Pfizer paid $42 million for a 32-state settlement uh, for unfair, deceptive, and um, unsubstantiated claims in promoting two of their drugs. So a question that could be raised, should corporations that behave in this way be allowed to continue to make unlimited and secret political donations? The third example is the Toyota Corporation. I'm sure you're all aware there have several agencies in Ann, Ar in Ann Arbor in southeast Michigan. They were recently ordered to pay $1.2 billion fine by the U.S. Justice Department to settle a criminal probe because of uh, safety problems leading to an 8 million car recall. At the time of the fine was reported Attorney General Holter uh, was quoted as saying, today we can say for certain that Toyota intentionally concealed information and misled the public about safety issues leading to the recalls. And I'm sure you're, most of you are aware the same accusations are being made uh, right now about uh, the General Motors recall, that, that it's not resolved yet. So the question is, what ethical responsibility should corporations be expected to have irrespective of whether there's appropriate regulations that are in place or whether they're adequately enforced? So the last two are in the, in the east. The first one is in West Virginia. In January of this year, 
7,500 gallons of a crude hydrocarbon, which is used to wash coal, belonging to Freedom Industries, leaked from a storage tank. The material entered the Elk River, which runs through Charleston and adjacent counties, and left 300,000 residents in nine counties without access to potable water for some, some along, as long as a week, and in some cases longer than that. The spill cold the spill co 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 caused, excuse me, closure of schools, businesses, and hospitals. It was reported that the storage facility had not been properly inspected for 23 years. The question is obviously, why is that? And finally, in North Carolina, Duke Energy was um, was accused of spillage of. 36,000 tons of coal ash into the Dan River in February of this year. It coated the river bottom with toxic coal, coal ash for 70 miles on the North Carolina-Virginia border. Later <clears throat> this year, just in March, Duke Energy was discovered to be illegally pumping 60 million gallons of coal ash from two storage tanks into the Cape Fear River which is a source of drinking water for uh, several cities and towns. So it was pointed out in the, uh, <clears throat> by the way, all this material is referenced on the back table uh, if you're interested. And uh, particularly uh, the local issues are, I've given you some links as to how to find it easily. <laughs> Through the, through the search uh, without having the actual link. And I think you'll find it very interesting. And uh, particularly the, uh, the organization uh, SRSW, I've given you that information, uh, which is a local information, uh, a local organization uh, following very closely this problem and has some very inf good information and, and information how you could become involved if you're interested. So environmental groups, and regarding back to the North Carolina problem, the mo no environmental groups have been pressing the state of North Carolina for years to require utilities to move the coal ash storage to dry lined landfills away from the sources of the drinking water. These ones that were leaking were right on the banks of these rivers. So the question is, why hasn't this happened? And then a secondary question, is it just possible that corporate financial and lobbying influences was a factor in the failure of the state of North Carolina to take action? And then I'd just like to close in saying, <clears throat> these examples seem so egregious that in her human terms, they seem inexplicable. Only when one realizes that corporations are not human beings and that the cost <clears throat> of avoidance of these potential problems to a corporation's bottom line negatively affects any ethical considerations that would lead to the corporation doing the right thing. And it frequently then leads uh, to the externalization that Don talked about. Um, with a lot of costs going to individual citizens and a community and necessitating often prolonged legal battles which only partially compensate those injured or those individuals or co communities that have been damaged. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I wanted to uh, return the theme to uh, the impact of Citizens United on uh, us as a community and on neighboring communities. Uh, and as a prelude to that, uh, I might mention that the impact of uh, Citizens United um, uh, has been to uh, has been really contained in the Dodd-Frank rules, 
the rules were precipitated by the bad behavior of J.P. Morgan Chase and other big banks. And the, uh, the principal writer of uh, most of the Dodd-Frank rules is Senator Christopher Dodd, and he wrote explicitly that uh, the rules uh, which he is uh, uh, promoting are intended to apply only to the few dozen big banks with holdings of over $50 billion and more. Well, unexpectedly, as an unforeseen consequence, uh, the Dodd-Frank rules regarding banks have spilled over and affected our local community banks. And to give you one example, the uh, Bank of Ann Arbor, before the emergence of the Dodd-Frank rules and the new banking regulations, uh, it employed one uh, compliance officer. After the, the Dodd-Frank rules came out, it now has to employ four and a half compliance officers, which is a very large uh, salary, annual salary and expenses change. So there is an example of the impact of a national bank on our local community. There's much more to it, um, but I'm going to ask Bob Monks now to come up and uh, say something. I think he's going to speak first about the impact of Citizens United on the judicial process and may even give us an example of a local impact on the judicial process. Bob. Thanks, Don. Can you hear me? Maybe I should, should I pick, no. get closer? There were problems with height. And, and this is one of the bits of my eyes are getting, getting a little old and what have you. Thank you very much, Bob and Don. I appreciate the chance to uh, be able to be with you today because these are subjects about which I've thought for a long time. I want to try and discuss this Citizens United opinion in a way that is that will get your attention. I think Citizens United, in its clear implications, can well destroy public confidence in one of our branches of government, the judiciary. And that is a really, really, really serious thing because our country is built on trust. And in so many ways, you know, legislatures, executives, what have you, they're all things that take place in great buildings with big domes and a whole bunch of processes. And they don't really touch a person. People come in contact with the judiciary. Everybody knows that there's a judge somewhere who's supposed to adjudicate right and wrong. Nothing complicated, no Dodd-Frank, no thousands of laws, just right and wrong. When you encounter right and wrong in the country, you, you're talking about the judiciary. The judiciary is how we encounter the capacity of government to make our life better. Something's wrong, you go to the judge. If you're right, it's adjudicated. Also, it's to be remembered about the judiciary that through a combination of circumstances in, on our federal system, it is ultimately the judiciary who say what at the end of the day is right. The president says something, the Congress says something, but if the judiciary says something different, it's the judiciary that prevails. And I don't have to remind you of recent history in which there have been five to four decisions that have had a most remarkable impact on all of our lives. Uh, just the previous president of the United States arrived there by a five to four decision, which I will mention somewhat later in my comments. So what we're talking about now is a, a subject which touches people in their, how they experience government, and it touches us in terms of the ultimate framework of government. 
I want to make an illustration of this by saying how money affects the judicial system. And to do that, as Don mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about a specific case, and I have very good news for you. If I'm confusing or boring, there is a wonderful book written by John Grisham called The Appeal, and I commend it to you, not least because it only costs $4.75 on Amazon, but because it's, it really is a, a, an experience you should have. You should read this story. Now, the, the Grisham book, uh, theoretically, was based on a, a real case called Caperton versus A.T. Massey Coal Company. And I'm going to digress for a minute here um, just to share with you some personal experiences. As a very young man, I was in the coal business. I actually um, was the owner and CEO of a company that employed about 4,000 miners in West Virginia. And so I'm very familiar with the coal business and how it functions. And indeed, I know um, Austin Caperton, and I was a competitor of the Massey Company. So when I'm reading about this case, um, it rings true to me. I understand what was happening. I, I have to say to you, um, it, it, was quite, it was really extraordinary. I was quite young, and I got a phone call when I was the head of this company. And it was a man from our, the mine we had in Quinwood, West Virginia. And he said, you know, Bob, we lost somebody yesterday. I said, what do you mean we lost somebody? Like, when we find them? He said, no, no, somebody died. I said, what do you mean somebody died? He, he said, don't you know? I said, what do you mean don't I know? He said, don't you know we have a death rate in the mines? Said, we have a what? <laughs> and he said, one person per thousand per year. I suddenly thought, I'm running a company that's going to kill four people this year. And I have to tell you, that wasn't a very pleasant feeling. And when, we were to, when I heard you talking about the leaching into the fields, I had to think of, in back of our minds, these um, piles. When, when you dig coal, you don't just get coal. You get coal and a lot of other stuff that sticks to it. And then they, then they quote, wash it. Well, I don't even tell you how that process takes place, but the word wash is, you know, it's the kind of thing that makes you, uh, you, you fear for the integrity of the language. Uh, what they do is they separate <laughs> one kind of dirt from another. <laughs> and and what the, some of it we can sell as coal. The rest of it is, goes into a gob pile. There's more gob than there is coal. Well, so, so the gob pile is pretty expensive to move that gob. So you don't move it. You just pile it up. And about every 10 years you read, guess what? The gob pile collapses. And, you know, that isn't one person per thousand per year. Everybody who's in the valley dies when that happens. So the coal business um, has a lot to, to um, it, it's a very difficult thing. Incidentally, today's a very good day. The Supreme Court, incredibly enough, upheld the EPA in limiting um, the use of sort of the worst kind of coal. And I'm very grateful. I live in a little town in Maine, and I have the worst air quality for anybody around. And it comes from that coal burning. So I'm thrilled. Happy days. But um, unhappily, coal also has the characteristic of being the cheapest form of energy. And here is where we get to the point of, of our talk. If you only measure cost in terms of dollars that are recorded on the accounting statement as required by generally accepted accounting principles, coal is cheap. But suppose you account for it and you take into account my experience with deaths in the gob piles. Those don't appear as costs. And we're not going to be able to have a harmonious relationship between human welfare and corporate power until we begin to take into account the real costs of doing things. And th this is, is, is a great example of that. Now, in the, in the Caperton case, I'm just going to read to you a brief summary so that um, it will be clear. In 1998... Hugh Caperton filed a lawsuit against A.T. Massey Coal Company, alleging that Massey fraudulently canceled a coal supply contract, resulting with his business going out of business. The West Virginia Coal Company found in favor of Caperton and awarded $50 million in damages. While the case was awaiting hearing in the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, 
A.T. Massey's chief executive officer, Don Blakenship, became involved in the re-election campaign, pitting Supreme Court Justice McGraw against Charleston lawyer Ben Benjamin. Blankenship created a nonprofit corporation called, and for the sake of the kids. That was the name of the thing he organized, for the sake of the kids. Through which he contributed over $3 million in Benjamin's benefit. This amounted to more than the total amount spent by all other Benjamin supporters and Benjamin's own campaign committee. Most of the money went to an advertising campaign questioning McGraw's competence. McGraw lost. In 2007, when the case came before the West Virginia Supreme Court, Caperton asked for Judge Justice Benjamin to recuse himself because of his contributions during the campaign. Benjamin declined and was ultimately part of the three to two majority that overturned the $50 million verdict. How do you like that? <laughs> Supreme Court of the United States, to my immense gratification, overruled the opinion of the West Virginia Supreme Court by guess what? Five to four. Thank God we got the five that time, but that was very rare. Now, what is at stake here, and how does Citizens United come into this? I come from a state, and indeed, uh, I've lived in Massachusetts and Maine all my life and practiced law in both states, and we appoint judges. And I'm f familiar with the federal judiciary where we appoint judges. I'm not familiar myself with electing judges. Indeed, I have to say, it's a matter of how how very tunnel vision we all have, that you just get used to what you know. It's, it's quite a surprise to me to find out the extent, I mean, the millions of dollars would go into races for Supreme Court justices in Michigan. Um, it's just extraordinary. But if, if you stop and think about this simple case of Massey and Blakenship, you know, where, where it was one vote at each level, and it, and it was found that it was bought, and the court... God bless them, said they couldn't do it. Stop and think of what is the impact of money on judges. Um, judge, I mean, judges are like you and me. I mean, you know, judge, I mean, I could be a judge. I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, you know what a judge is? A judge is a lawyer who knew a governor. Uh, um, and and um, you know, I've known governor. I could be a judge. I mean, anybody could be a judge. We aren't superhuman people. Thank God I'm not a judge. I don't, as you've probably gathered, have a very judicial temperament. But there it is. Um, I'm more interested in being a prosecutor, but um, the reality is that when you in introduce an amount of money into a political campaign, and certainly when you introduce corporate money into a campaign, you, you must thereby draw certain conclusions, particularly in the case of the corporation. Corporations are run according to a series of rules, one of which is that money must be expended by the officers for the benefit of the corporation. Well, stop and think. On one hand, we have a legal system that says corporations must be limited in what they do with corporate assets to something in aid of the corporation. Otherwise, they'd be held liable for Waste. All right? There's this person here. He's got to do it for the benefit of the corporation, otherwise it's waste. And here's this person here who was getting this money. He's receiving the money, and what's he going to do with it? How is he going to respond? Has this man been negligent because he gave to somebody who wouldn't act in his interest? Has he been stupid because he realizes that the judge can't be influenced by what he's done? Or is he actually going to influence the judge? You know, you can't suspend disbelief. Uh, human beings are human beings, and people are naturally going to be inclined in favor of those who help them. Okay, that's how we stand before Citizens United. Now let's go a step further. With Citizens United... Justice Kennedy 
really disgraced himself. I'm sorry. That's a very rude thing for a civilian to say, but he's a class behind me in law school, and I feel inclined to put down my junior. <laughs> and and just, Justice Kennedy said that there were two questions that he wanted to answer about why he didn't want to limit corporate expenditures in, in politics. One of them was that if the corporation was behaving improperly, there existed ample scope for the shareholders of the corporation to act appropriately and to stop it. It's their corporation, they can stop it, right? Wrong. <laughs> I spent 30 years trying to make that better with virtually no success, and I can tell you that is wrong. Second point, and this is the critical one in our context of what I'm now talking. He said, well, they will know to whom the contributions are being made. And if they don't like what their managers are doing, they can do something about it. They do not know to whom the contributions are being made. Contributions are being made through a variety of what the French call, with great delicatesse, a lage, a laundry. It cleans the money, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. They get $100 million. Where do they, who they spend it for? Forget about it. We don't tell people who we give our money to. So now we have, after Citizens United, the prospect of blind money going into judicial contests. So while I could understand that the five Republican Supreme Court, five Supreme Court justices nominated by a Republican president would find it hard to understand how Al Gore had been harmed by the electoral process in Florida, if I at least know who did it, and I must say that for people like myself, um, who are proud of being lawyers, it is horrifying to witness such a thing where five people appointed by a Republican come to a conclusion in favor of a Republican. It just, it, it tends to give a lack of, of, of integrity to the court. And here, after Citizens United, we're institutionalizing a lack of integrity because they can accept blind gifts. And Therefore, the ultimate implication of Citizens United, which is the subject of our talk here, is that one of the principal and most important organs of our having a civilized society can lose its legitimacy in the eyes of the public. Thank you. Well, we're at the point now where um, the next uh, topic is going to be what can we do about this. Uh, but before we move into that, uh, are there any questions you'd like to ask any of our uh, performers? Yes. GMI. Stands for Government, uh, Government Metrics International. And it refers to... Uh, an organization that examines all evidence um, in three categories for 6,000 different American corporations. Uh, governance, corporate governance, which includes the relations between shareholders and officers, the relations between CEOs and members of the board of directors. So that's one. The second is social impact, uh, which can, you know, it, it would include foreclosures, for example, uh, or various kinds of criminal charges that weaken a societal bonds. And the final one is environmental impact, which is uh, self-explanatory. Um, 
So much of the, not all, but a certain amount of the data that I used <laughs> to identify the uh, charges against J.P. Morgan Chase came from the records of, held by GMI ratings, which is, yes? Um, what, what is the entity that created or oversees the generally accepted accounting principles? And is there any? Yes. That is, okay. What is the entity that oversees uh, the generally accepted accounting principles? And, and has there been any move to try to um, address that, this question from that um, entity's perspective? Meaning to, to internalize the externalities yeah. into the accounting principles. There's a, a very, very good book written by a Columbia law professor named Jack Coffey uh, called um, The Professions. And in it, he recounts one answer to that question. And what he says is, generally accepted accounting principles are what the CEO says they are. <laughs> and, I, you know, uh, that, that's, he, he's not me. I mean, he's a, you know, very middle-of-the-road, statesman-like guy. And, and it's a, it, but that's true. Uh, now, we have all manner of organizations who are supposed to be producing accounting principles. And they do. Um, at the moment, we're in the middle of a very exciting possible change. And the change is originated in England, and it's called International Integrated Reporting Council, which is a new group, which is, in effect, trying to modernize, trying to do, accomplish what, what Don Monroe was saying, was to take into account on the financial statements the external costs, or to take into account what I was saying in talking about the coal industry, you know, the fact that they kill people and that they, you know, destroy property, and that that becomes part of the cost. And I, in my own view, this is the most hopeful development of, uh, which is now occurring, as we've tried for many years to try to make corporations be accountable. And thinking that if you could make corporations be accountable to their owners, you would thereby be able to harmonize the impact of corporate functioning on human welfare. That turns out to be a pretty unequal struggle. And I have to say that, you know, um, we've huffed and we've puffed and they've won. Um, the, the corporate power has not only taken over shareholders, but it's also captured government in this country. I mean, the, the, if you wonder why things have happened in this country in the last 30 years that are different, including things like the pay ratio that Don mentioned, it, it's because corporate power has taken, has taken over control of the agenda. Now, the other way of doing this is to say, okay, we can't do much that way, but one way we can do is to change the rules by which they work, and that is, that is the accounting rules. This is the code of conduct. And I, there, there really is a possibility. There are, are now a number of corporations who've begun to try to release financial statements with supplemental material that includes uh, the, the impact of what have been considered to be external costs on their earnings. And I, I believe that this is a very encouraging line to do. And ultimately, you know, people who have power don't give it up easily. And um, so it, nothing will be simple. But this ought to be, what I've been asking them to do is to give up power, which needless to say is something that hasn't made me one of their favorites. Um, but what an accounting rev revolution could do would be to mean that all companies would do business under the same set of rules. And so people who run companies aren't bad people. It's just bad on us for giving them a set of rules under which they could do this externalization of costs. But if we manage to change the standards across the board, then we can continue to have the benefits of corporate wealth creation at the same time as mitigating or eliminating the external costs. Thank you. Thank you. For so Bob. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with this book uh, that was written in the 70s called Economic Democracy? No, sir. In that book, uh, the gentleman who's addressing these very topics suggests that the, the uh, problem goes to the chartering 
of corporations. And that the reason that all these corporations charter in Delaware is because it was one of those race to the bottom kind of things. We have the least amount of regulations in Delaware. So Delaware set it up, you know. So his advocation was we should have a national debate about what a corporation can and can't do. And we should charter these corporations nationally. You know, this is a, uh, what do you call it, a legal fiction. A corporation is a made up thing that the, the government charters them and allows them to exist. So that means that how is it that they're telling us how we should set our rules, we should be telling them how to set their rules. And would you formulate the question, please? Don't you think that a national uh, chartering of corporations, a national uh, federal chartering, wouldn't that be a, an advantageous thing? rather than having everyone run off to the state with the lowest expectations. When you, if you were to do that, you could incorporate all the principles that we're talking about here in the charter of the corporation. It would change how corporations operate because they'd have a different criteria for even existing. Okay, thank you for the question. Very good question. Well, I'm glad I've had about 40 years preparation for that question <laughs> because my, my um, law school classmate, uh, um, uh, Ralph Nader, uh, among other things, wrote a book recommending that. And um, I've had a long time having to try to defend myself by disagreeing with Ralph, which is very hard to do as he's um, a man who is entitled to a great deal of credibility. You know, the hell of it is, um, you know, they fix the state legislature, they'll fix the Congress. I, I'm sorry, it must just be, I must just be getting to be an old man. That's a pretty cynical thing to say. <laughs> but, but the reality is, is that, you know, the reason why Delaware is an easy place to incorporate, because they've got a huge, you know, legal, I mean, half the state is, you know, you know what percentage of the state taxes of Delaware are paid by c c corporate chartering fees? Probably 1% or something. 30%. 30%. I mean, you know, you know, you live in Michigan where people are looking around for sources of revenue. You ought to have a corporate statute like Delaware has. My God, you wouldn't have to pay anything. Um, I mean, it's disgusting. So, but unhappily, look, I, you didn't make the federal system. I didn't make the federal system. And, and curiously enough, you know, the, the, the word corporation does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. Um, so this was, we are the United States. You, you know, uh, and, and the, the, the importance of the states was retained. And, and now, of course, you know, most large law firms are supported by corporations. And if you had one single federal law of corporations, you'd have 50 bar associations who would be seriously in want of high-paid revenue. And that ain't going to happen. Um, so it, 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 that's not a, I, I apologize. My answers are of a low quality of intellect and a high level of cynicism. Um, but, but, but my, my idea is that, that you set the bar and you, and you figure out what would be a just system and then you go for it. I mean, that's what we're doing with the 28th Amendment, right? We don't throw up our hands and say, well, we could never make that work. That's like surrendering. Uh, uh, I, the, really, I really have to protest against your cynicism. <laughs> Listen, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Another question? Uh, can, can I ask yes, you please. Yeah, you're it. Please. Um, so this is in another category of how, how can we get this done. I'm going to ask about institutional investors. and. Uh, institutional investor, investors today have large holdings. I'm thinking of the Norwegian government that you uh, referred to last night. BlackRock would be another one. Um, but there are also university endowments and pension funds and life insurers. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, only because it appears to me that university endowments have been very lacking in transparency in terms of their investment making decisions. And further, they have not included some of the sustainability um, measures that you've talked about. Is, is the use of pressuring university endowment uh, committees effect, an effective way to go about this? It should be. 
I mean, that, that's really where, it, it, for, for, for a whole variety of reasons, um, the shareholders and institutional shareholders have been very silent. And they've been silent because it's convenient to be silent. And the people who should least be excused for being silent are those who are institutionally trying to teach ethics, trying to promote a sense of the public good. And, and this would be university endowments and foundations. And it is a, 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 a shocking indictment of current levels of concern that they've been so quiet for so long. Now here uh, you have a wonderful opportunity as I think the uh, University of Michigan is one of the ten largest endowments of any universities in the world. And so it's a good place to start. The difficulty that you, that you will encounter is one, I, I've spent 30 years trying to get the largest university endowment in the world to do anything. And um, I have got to the point of getting polite letters of rejection in contrast to um, impolite letters of rejection. <laughs> um, it, you know, they just don't want to do it. And the reason why is because first, uh, they get contracts from, uh, I'm being cynical again, I'm yeah, sorry. I know. Yeah, I know. Well, you yeah. have to be realistic. I know. I Look, my father was a clergyman, and he, he, he sort of immunized me against you know, being cynical. I have the spirit that's right. Um, but the, and, and a lot of the trustees are apt to come from, from the, these communities. As a practical matter, I've found it very, very difficult to be able to get people who want to hear or are willing to hear what I have to say. But your, your question is exactly right. These are the people who ought to be doing something. I mean, I mean, the people who teach ought to have a consistent institutional message when they invest. And so um, there, there's really where it could start. And if one university did it, that would be enough to get all of them doing it. Because one of the things about fiduciary law is that it is a matter, it, it's a flexible standard. And if, if the University of Michigan stands up and says that the standard for being an ethical institutional investor is that we must involve ourselves and raise the questions that uh, Bob and Don have raised about these particular companies, that that's what you have to do to be a proper institutional investor, that will set a new world standard. So what you can do here in the University of Michigan could change the world. Thanks so much for that. I, um, let me uh, begin to wind things down by continuing the, the topic of what you can do, what I can do. Um, this is a topic that... Uh, Bob O'Neill and I and Janine DeLay have talked about among ourselves. And one of the things that we discussed was this. You might begin sometime uh, trying to, to identify some of the human moral values that are important to you and to your family. Uh, maybe you share them with uh, neighbors or something. And if you find evidence that those are being violated by some corporation, discuss that phenomenon with friends and neighbors. And then you can take certain steps. One of them would be to um, contact the city council, your city council members, and see if the city is trying to entice through uh, certain tax favors some corporations to move here. When, you, uh, when they consider the desirability of that, then ask them to consider um, the violations of the human moral values that you have seen perpetrated by the company. I think uh, your findings in that matter can also be brought to the attention of uh, your uh, elected uh, representatives. Uh, another thing uh, sounds brutal, but it probably is the most uh, effective way of dealing with the situation when you find 
the moral values that you and your family and neighbors cherish. Um, and that is to promote a customer boycott, a customer or buyer boycott of their products. That's not hard to do. It's uh, done frequently all the time. Um, so uh, the final thing is to uh, join the organizations that I mentioned yesterday evening. Uh, the local organization uh, would be the two that are sponsors of this program, um, a2ethics.org. <laughs> Uh, or IPPA.us, or a very large organization, Reclaim Our American Democracy, uh, .com, uh, which has 300 members locally, and also um, the one represented by Jeff Clements last night, which is uh, Free Speech for Persons. Uh, the point is that there exist already organizations of which you can become a part and that can become a voice uh, for the concerns that you have. Are there any other suggestions about what can be done? Yes. Uh, so there is a um, documentary called Citizen Coke about the Coke brothers. Yes. And um, that documentary uh, I saw last summer, and I met the directors and creators of it. They lost uh, their funding from PBS because the Koch brothers are such big donors to WNET in New York. They did a kick, um, you know, a crowd fundraising campaign to get the last 170,000, and the film really centers on Citizen United looks at um, what happened in Wisconsin 2011 when Americans for Prosperity, which is the Koch brothers super PAC, funded Scott Walker and what <laughs> happened with collective bargaining rights. The film is now coming out today for the first time in Madison and it, it will be coming to different cities and it would just be encouraged. Say the name again, please. It's called Citizen Coke. Citizen Coke, thank you. K-O-C-H. Thank you very much. Question. Uh, yes, in fact, the former questioner just uh, referred to what I was going to ask is, do any of you know of any instances where community organizations are using social networking methodologies for getting the word out to the public, such as Twitter or Facebook? Uh, because, you know, obviously we've certainly seen in uh, other instances where, you know, uh, issues have become much well, more well-known once somebody gets them out, you know, on Twitter and, you know, starts getting people to respond to them. So. I don't know myself the answer to that question. Um, yes, do you? Well, I can tell you for sure that Road has a very active <coughs> Facebook Page. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and most of those other organizations have some as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, our community bank has uh, such, a, such a website, the Bank of Ann Arbor. Okay, good. Yes? Sometimes <clears throat> when there is a shareholder resolution, there are web pages that are available uh, for people to involve themselves. And uh, the rules on that are just evolving. But um, a lot, there are a lot of occasions when there will be a shareholder resolution that the SEC allows to come in. And when it comes in, there's a lot of public discussion, and, and that's a great place to be involved. <coughs> West Vivian. Um, the, uh, you might notice the sign on the shirt. Could you go over to the microphone, please? <laughs> it's right in the middle of the aisle. I guess I could. Uh, and open up your shirt again. Let's uh, <laughs> have it. Oh, uh, yes. Road, R-O-A-D, Reclaim Our American Democracy from Big Money. It's a local organization uh, run by Stu Dowdy, who lives down near Celine. And, uh, Could you get up to the microphone, please, Wes? Okay. Thank you. 
we have uh, quite a few members, uh, but the people who get together every week, every uh, month or so are only about 15 or 20 of us. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to get the uh, a, a uh, action within the state of Michigan on the subject of Citizens United, namely to have the state of Michigan take take a position like a number of other states have that uh, this should be overturned by an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now, there are many arguments as to what the words of that amendment should be, but that's not the immediate problem. The immediate problem is to get a large number of citizens of the United States to express their views so that members of Congress, and I happen to be a former member of Congress, uh, they had a large enough number of me members of, of the United States citizens so that members of Congress are scared not to act on this subject. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's really what you're aiming for, and for state representatives. <laughs> having so much public viewpoint strongly expressed that everybody is going to say, uh-oh, I better, I better take a position against Citizens United. Now the way we're trying to get it done is two different ways. One is to go to individual cities and towns and townships and to ask them to have a resolution which says we should overturn Citizens United with an amendment. And so far we had no problem at all in getting such an effort on the part of the city of Ann Arbor. That's quite a while ago I was involved in that. Uh, we also got uh, good results from the city of Ypsilanti. But uh, we haven't uh, been uh, energetic enough to uh, yet approach, what should I say, uh, Chelsea, Dexter, Milan. Uh, keep, keep put, put your list of towns, t cities and towns in, in this county and then uh, to approach the county itself and to approach the other, uh, any other organizations, but the, the thank you, thank you, Wes. I have a, I have a suggestion. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, for people's consideration as to how that might be, proceed. Um, we have a shortage of people in their twenties and thirties here, and in the Voices Against Citizens United. Maybe we should, in our organizations, make an effort to engage people who are younger and more energized and have as a purpose, among other purposes uh, for them, uh, outreach to these councils. I'm very what do you think? Is agree that, with that, that one, Don. Yeah. In any event, uh, there are two ways of going about this. One is to go, is to approach these local governments and to slowly stretch our way through all of Washtenaw County and then neighboring counties. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, uh, the second way to do this is to ask each township or city or, or county to have a vote on this subject, have, a, have it be Good. a vote for the, for the residents to express their opinions. That would be a little difficult for the May 9th election, which is only a week yes. or two away. May but, 6th. But there's only, May 6th, thank yeah. you. Uh, there's only a, a uh, there, there are a couple of other elections coming up. Uh, remember now it's four years since this has happened, so <laughs> we have many elections coming up. Yes. And we've got to take action. Very good. Thank you very much. That's a great idea. Now I want to end. A bigger pardon? I want to end by asking, is there any more, are there any comments or questions for us at this point? Yes. I'd, I'd, um, I'd like to suggest that we make the 28th Amendment a ballot initiative in the state. Very good, very good suggestion. I think we would all support it here. Yes. My, my comment was, is when I was growing up in, in Wisconsin in the uh, 50s and 60s, there was an iconic uh, editor who had a weekly address, and at the end, every time he would say, give the people the truth and the freedom to discuss it, and all will be well. And I think the truth is, 
that assumes a functional democracy, which we don't have right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a whole lot more because already uh, large majorities of people without even being especially informed uh, uh, oppose Citizens United. It's just, they know it's wrong. Uh, but how you, the Occupy movement obviously got closed down. The, the movement for a constitutional amendment seems to me sort of the one hopeful way to really make a fundamental change and, and it raises the fundamental issues uh, Well, I think your, some hope. the point is well taken. If Jeff Clemens from last night were here, he could furnish the statistics on the number of uh, organizations uh, and groups such as this that are bl blossoming around the country. So that I think the trajectory is up and he's confident of its continuation. Yes, final um, comment? Que comment? Question? Yeah, question. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, able to attend these meetings, and I'd like to mo know more about the uh, sponsoring uh, organizations. Are they open? Totally open. Well, can you tell me when they meet? Where do they meet? Well, you have to go on the websites for that. Uh, eight, the the president of A2 Ethics back there uh, will come to the mic and say something. I can just answer that briefly. Of course, we're open. A2 Ethics is really not a membership organization, and we're a 501c3, so uh, for the most part, we only do advocacy for very special cases. We have an IRS ruling that we need to abide by. So that said, um, certainly feel free to come to uh, any of the events that we sponsor. And this is one of the events that we're sponsoring. Um, but you can address IPPA. Yeah, IPPA uh, used to have regular meetings. But in recent years, it has principally a website, uh, which is IPPA.us, on which essays on topical matters are, are posted. We do not have a regular group of uh, people who meet at a regular time. The closest thing to that is ROAD, uh, Reclaim Our American Democracy, uh, dot com, which meets once a, once a month. Um, yeah. I, I want you to know that there, over on the table back there, there's a little card which contains information about Reclaim Our American Democracy. So um, those of you who would like to help us work with us, please pick up one of the cards. Uh, the other, the other organization that has many, many resources that Stephanie Philbrick just uh, remarked to, to me, and she is the director of communications for Bob Clement, uh, for Bob Monks, is uh, Jeff Clement's organization, FreeSpeechForPeople.com, has many resources listed on its website. And further, uh, if you look at the A2 Ethics material um, that we included. We included many sources sourcing the, um, the exhibit, but more importantly, we have a whole list of getting involved, getting informed with a whole range of organizations that you can uh, join, some of which are local and some are national. So please, uh, please look at those. Thanks. I think that, oh, comment, question. Let me just tell you about another organization, a national one, that's been working on election uh, law and, and financing and so on for a long, long time. It's called Democracy 21. And, uh, and you, that's where is it located? D.C., Washington. And is it uh, democracy21.org? Uh, yeah. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. I guess that ends the day. Thank you for your attention.